it fell for the fourth week in a row, its longest losing streak since August of last year. 46 out of the Nifty 50 stocks recorded losses for the week, some of them losing up to 22%. Hello and welcome to Editor's Roundtable. This week, we'll put the spotlight on the bank's second quarter earnings. We'll decode the demand slowdown scene in FMCG. And we'll take stock of India's biggest IPO, Hyundai Motor. I'm Reema Tanduka. With me, Prashant Nimesh and Mangalam joining in. And also joining us on the show is Prashant Khemka, Founder, Managing Director at White Oak Capital Management. Hi. Hi, boys. Hi. Hey. <laughs> what a week this was, right? We, we've been saying for the fourth straight week now we're saying what a week this was. But this is the week where we saw brutal selling, yes. right? Yeah. Uh, Finally, you know, the signs of capitulation. Capitulation. Yeah, just especially in the broader markets. Uh, you know, we've been saying of, uh, for a while now that retailers are not making money. This was a week when retailers, investors, every category of investors have actually lost money, especially mm. from a near-term perspective. I mean, lost money means, uh, of course, a lot of people have made 4x, 5x. But again, to, to see the profit right. going down or the, or the profit getting trimmed, it's also a loss in the book, right? So it, it's been a kind of a week where it's this been was, brutal. I guess also it's, the week where, you know, a lot of the earnings that came by told you that things perhaps may it not be only as... only because of the earnings. Earnings. This fall, earnings. This fall, look at, look at India has relatively underperformed and that the only reason for underperformance is the weak numbers. I mean, we expected weak, but to see this kind of weak numbers, it was totally. a bit, bit of a eye-opener for a lot of people. The mid-cap index itself went into correction zone, having fallen 10% from the recent you know, week. It was so bad that I was just coming up and I was seeing uh, that uh, today is a good day because we recovered 150 points from, from the, the lows. <laughs> but now still we were, ended down? <laughs> we were down 190, <laughs> but it just felt better that we actually bounced uh, about 150 off the day's low. And remember what happens is when you, you know, initially what happens is your profits are, you, you know, the loss, the fall is eating into your profits. Yeah. Yeah. But I think People who came in in the last six, seven, eight months, they're negative. You know, they must be uh, negative because yeah. you know, uh, and you know, some of the older people because they made so much money, they would have done things which ne ne normally they would not do. You know, get into slightly riskier stuff. Chalo, ye le liya, wo le liya, paisa ban raha hai. But I think all of that would be starting to. You heard Nilesh saying yesterday, be, right? That this year, all the gadhe gode, all the chale the. Now, 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 I think uh, Prashant Khemka is with us, and he'll have uh, lots of answers because the big question, of course, is uh, with regards to uh, the uh, FII selling. I don't want to put some numbers off uh, on the on the screen. This is just purely how much markets are off the all-time highs. Uh, and uh, very quickly, I'll put that, and then we'll bring uh, Prashant in. Uh, so the Nifty is down 8% from its all-time high. Bank Nifty is down 7.5. Mid and small caps are down 9.8 and 9.6. So very close to the 10% cut mark from the all-time highs. Uh, there you go. The, the, the graphics are on your screen now. And next sectors, right? PSUs, of course, topped out the earliest. And that was called the, uh, the, the leader of the bull market. The point is the leader is now uh, has lost way. So you need another leader, which is, which is yet to be found. Uh, that's down 22.5% from its all-time peak. Oil and gas index is 17. Real estate is down 16. Uh, autos are down 14. And metals are down about 13% from its all-time high. And I just want to wrap this up and then throw it to Prashant. This is the question, the big question. Will FI stop selling first or will uh, local mutual funds run out of uh, sort of, you know, the so-called dry powder? That is the question. And this is, the, this is how the math adds up. So far in October, FIs have sold $12 billion of stock. Every month, they take in $4 billion of uh, inflow. Starting cash levels are about $16, $17 billion. You throw in all these big IPOs which have happened, Hyundai and the uh, QIPs and the, all of the others, and of course, the pipeline is strong. So, you know, if this intensity of selling continues from FIIs, will mutual funds who have been propping up dollar for dollar, will they start to uh, run out of that uh, dry, uh, dry powder? And then you, you, you get into a bit of a dizzy, get into some trouble. So let's put it to Prashant Khemka. Prashant, good to have you with us here. So the question is, why are FII selling? I think China and other reasons, but more importantly, are we at a point where we can say that the maximum selling has happened and the intensity should slow down? Go on. Certainly, Prashant. Uh, thank you, first of all, for having me on this special edition, Diwali edition. Uh, so it is impossible to say what the FIIs would do because anyways, FII is not like one a uh, monolithic uh, entity, but uh, made up of thousands of uh, investors. But as you pointed out, what is a fact is that China, after a long time, had a massive rally, and a lot of investors were very underweight in China. So I'm talking about emerging market fund managers, global equity managers, who had 
you know, written off China, uh, calling it uninvestable um, or otherwise uh, highly unpredictable. So they have a massive fear of missing out when some a market like China rallies 30, 35 percent. Uh, that causes a big hole in performance of many of these managers who are massively underweight. So they would naturally want to reduce that risk. And so they would cut weight from across the rest of the portfolio. India is the biggest component in the rest of the portfolio. So it's only logical that a lot of that money would come from India. And that is what I don't think India dedicated funds might have seen some outflows, but that is also in uh, from fund of fund structures or otherwise uh, clients managing their weights, um, relative weights by reducing from India fund and adding to China fund. Uh, otherwise, a lot of this reduction or outflow in India is EM managers, global equity managers trying to rebalance their position in China. So even if India was not much of an overweight, which it wasn't, uh, still some of the money would flow out of India. When it is likely to stop, it is uh, one of the impossible uh, things to predict. Um, I think bulk of it, gut feel is bulk of it is behind us in terms of FI outflows. Uh, but again, unfortunately, is partly dependent on uh, how the Chinese market does. And with the US elections, next outcome of that out next week or the week after, uh, that's likely to also have a bearing on China and indirectly on India, hmm. on the flows in particular. Sure. Uh, thanks, Prashant, for joining in. Uh, Prashant, I want to ask you about two sectors which you are very much on top of. One is the private banks, where you had an exposure, but they, they have not done well so far. So, uh, on the private banks, your, your opinion? And two, on the mid-cap IT. You've been very bullish on the mid-cap IT names for a very long time. Finally, this quarter saw a lot of sub positive surprises, you know, likes of Persistent and Coforge and all. So first, your view on, on private banks and, 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 and second on the, on the mid-cap IT names. Certainly, I think both these sectors have not participated in the last couple of years to the extent that, let's say, other mid-caps have. Uh, mid-cap IT stocks might not have participated over the last three years or so. And private banks have not participated to the extent financials have done well or to the extent that overall market has done well. Uh, now we can talk about operationally. Yes, operationally, private sector banks are uh, going through a rough patch because of you know credit costs rising, the deposit challenge that John Channel has talked about quite extensively, uh, and IT sector has been uh, for the last three years almost, yeah, from late twenty one onwards, uh, facing the headwind of uh, global tech spend. I won't say decline, but yes, some uh, slowdown after a massive ramp up post COVID. But where we are today, if you look at the last three months and even including today, some of the, the figures that Prashant was talking about, the sharp falls in mid caps, small caps and overall market and the various sector specific, you'll see the most substantial drawdowns are in the deep cyclicals in India or the so the deepest cyclicals and the weakest governance were the ones that had massive rallies over the last two three years particularly starting from March 23 so one and a half years I think the small cap index might still be up close to 100 percent or so and that was led by defense power manufacturing of various kinds uh, PSU as a pack overall including oil and gas which had humongous rally since about a year ago. So all those are the ones that are seeing uh, huge drops. PSU has been one of the leaders in, in this drop. Yeah? Whereas IT, uh, financial, private sector financials have been somewhat weaker, but nowhere near, I think, the rest of the market over the recent months. And IT has actually held up very well. Consumer staples in particular, despite the weak uh, results, have held up very well last three, four months. Healthcare has held up very well. Um, uh, so, you know, the market would need to be slicing and dicing. And within that context, IT has held up and private sector financials at this point, again, seem to be uh, very well positioned in an uncertain market. But all these negatives are now very well known. And it wasn't a sector which was fluffed up 
if you will, like many of the other uh, sectors which saw huge themat thematic funds, fundraises, thousands of crores and whatnot, they were kind of indicative of the tail end of a bull market in those uh, sectors, so even bubble in some of those sectors, and those are the ones giving back the most of the gains. Just want to quickly recap, uh, you know, the private banks numbers that came out through the week. Uh, so from last weekend to Friday, you had numbers from HDFC, Kotak Mahindra Bank, Indusin, RBL. And what stood out is that now the stress in the unsecured portion of the portfolio is getting more broad-based. So this is showing up in the form of increased credit costs, increased credit cost guidance, slippage ratios are going up, gross NPAs have gone up, earnings are getting hit. So particularly Indusin Bank, for instance, for the first time in 33 quarters, the company reported a drop in its core operating profit. NIMS are getting contracted. So at a time when there is stress in the asset quality, investors appear to be rewarding quality. So the only private, large private sector bank which managed to you know, clock in weekly gains this week was HDFC Bank as it closed up with a gain of close to about 3.5%. So HDFC Bank, as Bernstein put it, it appeared to be immune to all the troubles its uh, peers are facing uh, with a very resilient asset quality. And it appears that investors are now valuing quality and rewarding it. So that's just a you know, quick uh, recap of how the private banks perform, but we had a whole host of uh, consumer names too. Yeah, that exactly was, you know, the big talking point of this week itself. Uh, when did you see HUL fall 8% post yes. numbers, right? Uh, and, you know, it's, a, it's not a dinky toy stock which can just fall like that. It's one of the biggest falls. Uh, it, it really brought out some important uh, diversions in the consu consumer sector itself, the schism, that, as you call it. Let's talk a little about that itself. So, you know, you start with the demand dilemma. Um, Everyone's talking about rural being weak earlier and now seeing some gradual recovery in rural. But what came out of the blue was urban weakness. So HUL, for instance, called out moderating urban growth versus gradual recovery in rural. ITC itself said subdued demand conditions witnessed during the quarter. Nestle went out, Suresh Narayanan said that, you know, there was shrinking middle class impacting FMCG sales. Tata Consumer did say that there has been, you know, urban Im uh, some impact because of uh, excessive rains, food inflation and flooding. And uh, Godrej Consumer this morning joined us and said that there has been mild stress in urban demand. United Spirits itself saw a decline in their popular volumes, even as prestige and above fell about 3.7%. Pidilite said, early to call whether this weakness is temporary or structural. And DMART was the first one to call out the quick commerce impact on its sales in Metro. Why is urban so important versus rural? Because urban sales account for 65% of the value and 35% of FMCG volumes whereas rural accounts for 65% volumes and 35% value. So if you're seeking value growth, you have to look at urban, and if you're seeking volume growth, you have to look at rural itself. And that's not all. There, the presentation of ITC tells you that there have been some concerns when it comes to urban demand as well. Food CPI for September at 9.2% has been sticky. PVs and two-wheelers have seen a decline of almost 19 and 9% respectively in the previous month. We've also seen GST collection at a 39-month low with fuel consumption by, uh, lower by about 1.7%. All of these things are pointing towards weakness in the lower half of the K. But twist all of this around and this is where the schism gets a little more interesting. Blinkit saw revenue growth of 129%. Zomato saw growth of 55%. Nika saw revenue growth in mid-20s. And at the same time, outside the listed space, we had big concerts during the quarter which uh, also sold out. You have Coldplay, Dalji, Dosa, JP Dillon, you know, the likes of all of them selling tickets worth nearly 350 to 400 crore rupees with a million people waiting in the lines as well. So CLSE had an interesting note which said that maybe the consumption patterns of India itself are changing right now. So then that leaves us with two questions. One, is the lower end of the middle class sinking a lot further and we're just left with a steepening K curve for our markets? And the second question is, are FMCG sales still the best barometer for consumption in an economy? Or have consumption patterns changed so much that we don't need to look at FMCG sales anymore? Um, those are two interesting and important questions. Let's, let's go across to Prashant for the same. Prashant, you know, staples, uh, while they have been resilient, they are talking about some sort of demand concerns in, uh, you know, urban areas. What, what's happening here? I mean, is the wealth effect now waning out with the weakness in the market? 
So Mangalam, definitely there is a, a from commentaries of all the uh, consumer companies or otherwise the banking sector, uh, what's coming through is has been a slow over the last many quarters is consumption was the commentary was more focused on rural consumption till very recently. And now what you've seen in results of many of the FMCG companies, particularly those who are more exposed to urban consumption, they've suffered more of a slowdown, whereas rural seems to be recovering. Uh, urban has had a somewhat of a higher base because it was doing quite well uh, till, uh, till recently. So what you are saying is very much true that the consumption patterns have moved around in, in different ways. One is from this uh, uh, geographic perspective, rural recovering and urban uh, facing some slowdown. And within the basket, that is a definitive change. Right now, the most crucial staple over the last few uh, years would be the phone, our uh, uh, cell phone. And that's a very expensive item, but it has become a staple. It's no longer really a discretionary. Uh, so consumers, be it rural or urban, are foregoing, a section of them at least, are foregoing other essentials or other discretionary items or spending on, uh, as you highlighted, electronics and entertainment, be it uh, events that you highlighted or be it, you know, the entertainment that they get uh, through the uh, fourth, uh, 5G phones or smartphones and so on, where the penetration is ever increasing and not just even if penetration is full, people keep on upgrading these phones for better uh, 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 better performance and and that is some way so in, in some ways not captured in in the reported numbers of the companies but it does impact the reported numbers of the companies you know, what's interesting is that increasingly the the saying is roti kapda makan and internet <laughs> that's what everyone says i want to add one to that <laughs> roti kapda makan internet and sip <laughs> you <laughs> know yesterday i'm not joking nimesh yeah, was there yeah, yeah. narain uh, yeah. was Namreen, in our office yeah. and uh, the, was very clear ramdev ji was Ramdeo there was and they were saying that actually they, it's of course i mean there's no way to confirm it they will right. buy it looks like people are yeah. willing to spend less on Every day, not every day, essential essentials, but other stuff. But they want to stop SIPs, SIPs. and yeah. because I, I don't know if it's delaying gratification in some way, it is right. I mean, because you know yeah. you're postponing consumption, yeah. but uh, we'll we'll see. I mean, that test is also coming. And and, and, and the roti kapra makan internet thing itself, you know, uh, uh, telecom companies have increased their uh, yeah. charges by about 10 to 15 percent across the board. So that also share of wallet going towards data may impact some of the FMCG consumption. Uh, the, Q, uh, the quick commerce bid, right? The numbers yes. are also, obviously it's not groceries which is being ordered through quick commerce. It's, it's not everything groceries. Else. It's in fact, yesterday, what Prashant was saying. Yesterday, yeah. Albinder Dhinsa put out, uh, you know, an EMI option for Blinkit. So anything yeah. that you're buying upwards of 2999 on Blinkit, you can spread it across a few months as EMI. So this obviously means that people are buying things worth more than 2999. And you saw how iPhone 16s, uh, uh, you know, sold off through quick commerce. So the average ticket size of quick commerce itself is increasing beyond groceries and now e-commerce is turning into quick commerce. We should ask uh, Prashant as well as to what, where do he stand? Uh, you know, Prashant, a lot of uh, FMCG companies have said that the e-com has impacted their businesses. Are you bullish on the digital businesses in India? Like the likes of Zomato, uh, Swiggy is going to list. Uh, we saw, you know, Ramduji putting money into Zepto as well. Uh, the entire digital space, uh, uh, where are you in that, in that, in that basket? Certainly, Nimesh, as we've discussed before, uh, uh, the team, our team, I would say, has always been very active in this new age, uh, so-called new age space. And while the stocks had a bit of a setback uh, from late 21 and through 22, uh, the operating performance of many of these companies continued to do very well. Uh, and the phase of 22, early 23, or even 23, I would say, uh, did result in quite a bit of consolidation. The weaker players in many of these segments got shaken out, and the stronger players, some of those you shown and are showing during this uh, show, many of those continued to build momentum, gain market share, even turn profitable in many of their segments and launch newer segments. We keep him Mexico. So the strong have gotten stronger through this two, three year period and obviously rewarded very handsomely. Not every one of those, but several of these have 
handsomely rewarded hmm. uh, investors and and that is also a dynamic not only in operating numbers that you are seeing yeah. but in the equity markets obviously uh, you are seeing and and very important point that reema and and mangalam touched upon when you think of how all these transformations transitions are reflecting in the markets for the last three and a half years starting from january 1st pretty much to the date january 1st 2021 value indices have substantially outperformed quality indices and these are all indices published by you know the likes of nifty and so on and our team has done quite a, a lot of work and there was massive outperformance of value indices so what are included in value indices the psus the utility mm -hmm. and so on compared to quality something that you know reema talked about quality and i that was something i missed when i talked about private banks doing better my mindset was more thinking of you know these top front line largest banks where we tend to focus on yes there is greater pain in the mid tier and the third tier of uh, private sector banks because there too within first across sectors but then right. within sectors investors are vastly big time differentiating between quality okay. and uh right. and and right. junk or value you know and that uh which is very apparent now in the performance over the last 3 months quality yeah. has started outperforming again yes. Yes. absolutely uh, wonderful points and great insights uh, prashant thank you very much for uh, joining us you may want to hang in there because nimesh is going to present something interesting how uh, how hyundai is now the cheapest mnc uh, uh, in the listed universe here in india so that's coming up on the other side stay with us Well, you know, the big talking point this week was the Hyundai IPO, and rightly so. It was one of the largest IPO in the India market. Had a tepid listing, but what is more interesting is after the listing and a, and a discount now is the cheapest MNC in the India basket. Uh, look at the Hyundai uh, listing. Uh, it uh, it got li I mean it got a fairly decent response as well. Subscription of two and a half times. Uh, for retail participation was around 50 odd percent. And uh, again, uh, the uh, the issue was at 1960, but currently standing at around 18 1800 rupees, which means. A 10 percent discount to, to the current price and commands a market cap of 1.4 lakh crore. Now I'm going to split this into three different buckets of MNC companies in India. The first bucket is uh, market cap of a, above one to five lakh crores in terms of market cap. The likes of Hindustan Lever, Maruti, Siemens, Nestle. Uh, look at the market cap and look at the multiples that they are trading at. 56 times on uh, on 25 and 26 for HUL. Uh, Maruti is at 25. Siemens is trading at 86 and 70. Whereas Hyundai is trading at around 25 times for FY25 and close to 22 times on FY22 times on FY26 earnings, that's the that's the valuation picture for MNCs above the one lakh crore market cap. Now the next uh, the next bucket is between 50 to one lakh crore market cap. The likes of Cummins India, Oracle, Colgate, Linde, Schaeffler, all are trading between 50 to 100 times on FY25 and between 50 to 80 times on FY26. But Hyundai is trading at close to 25 and 22. That's the uh, second bucket. The third bucket is between 25,000 crores of market cap to 50,000 crores of market cap. The likes of GSK, 3M, Crystal, Basav, Whirlpool. If you look at their, uh, you know, uh, multiples between 51 to 80 times, uh, even in this bucket on FY25 and on FY26 between 40 to 50 times on FY26 price to earnings. And even there, uh, Hyundai would look the cheapest. So, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, earnings, uh, in terms of multiples, Hyundai currently is the cheapest MNC. Uh, which is trading in the indian markets right now uh, if you look at the uh, you know stock performances of i've just picked up four five companies linde basav siemens abb this is a five year return cagr of 70 to 30, 40 odd percent returns and 10 year cagr has been between 35 to 20 odd percent as for these companies but i was just looking at the average the mnc basket on an average is given up between 20 to 40 percent returns over the five year and 10 year period so that's the kind of performance we've seen now the view on hyundai uh, per se a uh, lot of brokerages put out the reports on day one of the listing nimura came out with the report initiating a buy with a target price of 2472 and they believe that premiumization should drive high quality growth for hyundai going forward similar was a call from macquarie as well they initiated an outperform rating target price of 2235 and they believe that uh, hyundai deserves to trade at a premium versus the peers because of the uh, premiumization there as well uh, the other call was from motilal as well even they have a buy rating on the stock target price of uh, almost uh, 2350 And they expect a 17% EPS CAGR between FY25 and FY27. The only reduced call came from MK on the very first day, 
they have a target for 1750. The stock is pretty much closed now there. They believe that while the, while the franchise is quite strong, the, value, the, premium, uh, the valuation is at a premium. So, uh, broadly, uh, you know, the street is quite bullish on uh, Hyundai from a long-term perspective. The whole idea was, after the listing and a 10% down from the issue price, uh, Hyundai is now currently the cheapest MNC which is trading in the Indian markets. Interesting one there, uh, Nimesh. Uh, the cheapest MNC in the listed market. I saw, uh, you know, a lot of them trading, what, 40, 50, some even 100 yeah, times. Yeah. A large part of them also belong to my sector, the yeah. FMCG one. So I just had to keep quiet and, <laughs> you know, listen to what you had to say out there. So, so again, you know, the yeah. idea was a lot of people have been saying that, you know, Hyundai, tepid listing, this, that. Yeah. And, you know, a couple of uh, fund managers gave a very interesting thing that, you know, guys, okay, it's tepid, whatever. Uh, if you look, if you believe there is a growth, then this is the cheapest MNC in the in the India basket right now. Autos go through their own cycle, right? Of Maybe right now we're in it's a cyclical uh, sector. So right now we may be in a bit of a slow, yeah. uh, you know, slow downturn. Yeah, but once things pick is up, why, its valuation. Like piece that uh, you know, if you look at the entire MNC basket, the five-year, ten-year stock return so CAGR is between 20, 20 to 40 percent. So it's been a very strong performance for a lot of the MNCs in India in the last many years. So. That's, that's the reason why you know, I thought I'll put a spotlight on Hyundai. Well. Interesting data. Thank you, Nimesh. And with that, we're going to come to a close of another edition of Editor's Roundtable. Hope you enjoyed it. Enjoy your weekend. Uh, thank you for watching and stay tuned to CNBC TV 18 for more news and updates.